So uh, that's the way I see breaking balls. If I constantly see 83 miles an hour, I'm going to adjust the spin or, or the speed, and that ball is going to be inside the strike zone. I'm going to do damage on you. You know, I want that element of surprise. I want that ball breaking in the zone, out of the zone. And the best way for me to do that is have that ability to make the hitter think I still have that fastball in my pocket. Hey, this is More Than Velocity. I'm Bart Pear here with Ryan Croton and Jordan Osagara. And today we are happy to have Scott Emerson with us. Scott is a pitching coach uh, with the Oakland A's and has been for an unbelievable almost 20 years. Uh, he also works with uh, uh, Purpose Driven Baseball as a consultant there and helps with some of their clinics. Uh, we brought him on because he started conversing with Ryan on LinkedIn and Ryan, why don't you kind of explain that and then where, where it came, where it led to this. Yeah. Yeah. So on LinkedIn, I mean, I'm new to it. I, I, it's only this year that I started posting stuff. I've been kind of hidden behind the major league walls and, you know, kept my mouth shut. And so I started putting out more material, more, more, uh, uh, information, you know, and a lot of different things of biomechanics, arm strength, all sorts of things. And I wasn't getting a lot of response. It kind of concerned me. I was like, well, people, I'm seeing they're viewing it, but nobody's really commenting. And uh, Scott kind of opened the floodgates. So, you know, it, the thing that was amazing is that the first person to respond to one of my posts was at the highest level of the game. Like, there's no higher you can go as a pitching coach in the game as, other than the major league level. And, um, you know, you know, getting his feedback. And I thought, man, okay, this guy's got an opinion. And, and I gravitate to those people. I, I like learning about the things that they see, the things that they've experienced. Um, I don't know, we're probably close to the same age, but he's super wise. I, I just see that in the way he's talking. It's, it's, there's a ton of experience driven stuff from the, the way he looks at things as a coach. And, uh, you know, when someone like leaves a comment, uh, you know, it's, I, it questions you. And I like, that's amazing. You know, I wanted to dig in more. And so I looked at this guy's resume and, and for people who are listening to this podcast to find people in baseball working for, this is his 20th year with the same organization, you know, it's like half my age. He's been with the same organization uh, is, is it's remarkable. It really is. And that, that just is a testament for, of him doing a good job. You know, when we were at the angels, you know, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to meet him. Um, I was usually inside training players and not able to really fraternize with all the guys from the other teams. But, you know, they kicked our ASS and, and we couldn't figure it out. You know, we were like, you know, how did they and the games weren't high scoring. They weren't offensively crushing us. They had some players, uh, Simeon and, and some guys that are hitting the ball now, but they weren't like that with that team. And they were keeping us. Um, you know, to a one run deficit and winning, you know, a lot of low scoring games that they came out ahead. And, you know, the guy is a great pitching coach. He's able to really dial these guys in. So, you know, when I talked to him on LinkedIn recently, you know, I asked for him to be on here because there's a, there's a lot of things he preaches pitching, man, pitching in the world of baseball now. And you talk to pitching coaches and you talk to coaches that are, you know, uh, working in private industries we're, they're really focused on velocity. You know, even I, I'm at fault myself too. When I put things out biomechanically, you know, biomechanics doesn't really answer injuries right now. We can't predict injuries from biomechanics, but we can identify aspects that improve velocity. And when I put stuff out, you know, Scott's put it out here and he's like, you know, how, how's it affecting command, man? You know, are, are you looking at that stuff? And I'm just like, geez, I'm stumped because, you know, I have to tell him, no, we, we didn't. And, you know, that's a shortcoming of, my research, my understanding of, of pitching, you know, that he has. So I've rambled a lot about him and, you know, maybe Scott, you can give us some background on you because it, it's just interesting that you've been at one place for, for uh, that long. Well, you know, uh, I, I did start with the pirates uh, and, and coach for them for three, uh, three seasons and then went on to Oakland in 2003. Uh, I, I do think that, uh, you know, I am probably one of the only few major league pitching coaches that actually started from the bottom and got to the top. Uh, I've done, uh, I did rookie ball for two years, short season for a year. Uh, I was in the Cal league, a ball for four years. I was in double a for four years, 
triple a for uh for two i was the coordinator for two the bullpen coach the pitching coach but you know i was in the arizona fall league you know back in 2005 i think we today i'll still say uh we had the best team of all time in that fall league and then in 2004 i coached winter ball in mexico so to have all those um things under my belt uh, I, I wouldn't change it any other way because you know it, it's like you know pitching from the ground up coaching from the ground up you know you you see every level I would I always have guys well that don't really know me well you, you never did extend it I'm like yeah I did extend it for three years I got up at uh, 4 30 in the morning to be there at 5 30. well the Cal League yeah I did the Cal League with commuters four years the Texas League you know, the 12-hour bus rides, you know, AAA, the, the 6 a.m. flight, you know, Mexico, the fall league. So, you know, in, in the offseason, I really enjoy working with younger kids just to get a base of what they're learning. And, um, you know, my, my ideal is to gather all the information that's out there that's possible. You know, armcare.com. I, I love reading your guys' stuff. Unbelievable stuff that you guys are doing out there. And you know everybody else that's out there. You know, I don't always agree with them, um, but um, it's good to get those information because that's the, that's the information your players are getting. You know, every year I got 13 different guys to start to start the season with me. And you can have as many as 30 different guys. That's, in my opinion, 30 different corporations I'm working for, you know. I, I tell our guys, I don't work for you. You don't work for me. We work together to get you to be the best pitcher you can possibly be to maximize your potential. And everybody is coming from a different background and different area. And it's, it's a lot easier for me to change to the player than ask the change, the players to change to me. That's a, a fantastic point. And, you know, getting, getting yourself to, in a sense, change and adapt to the player, because that's one thing that people don't always realize is it's still the player's career. And they're the ones taking responsibility for it. And, you know, everything you just said there from starting from extended spring, which I've done plenty of extended spring trainings, those, those are a grind for players and coaches, for everyone involved. And you learn a lot about managing personalities at each one of those levels. And the personalities change. And if you don't mind going, going a little more in depth, I just think it's, I think it would be great for people to hear kind of what you learned in terms of managing the personalities, because that's so big at all levels of baseball, from what you learned from rookie ball all the way through the big leagues? Well, you know, it's great. Uh, once you get that kid in his first year, 19 years old or 18 year old in rookie ball, the first thing they always say to me is uh, my uh, my scout told me I'll probably be in double A AA or triple A the next year. And, and you're like, well, I don't really think he said that. So, you know, obviously we want our guys to uh, have an ETA to the big leagues. Uh, but, you know, baby steps, you, you got to take your steps. You know, I, I know guys, you know, at a young age would always say to me, uh, Emo, I got to get to double A. I got to get to double A. And I said, well, what you got to do is you got to work on your fastball command because you could get to double A without fastball command and then be right back where we are here in extended spring, learning how to use your fastball again. So, you know, everybody, you know, everybody in life now seems to want to go uh, as, get somewhere as fast as they can and not actually put in the time. You know, that's one thing, you know, I had the greatest farm director in the world and Keith Lipman talking about my 20 years uh, as uh, in the organization, you know, 42 years. And, and at the time he was farm director, 1990, all the way up to uh, 2019. That's a, that's a, that's a huge run uh, for a farm director. So I learned a lot about, uh, you know, taking one step at a time, you know, and uh, that's the thing you talk to the players about. Let's, let's get your tools right before we look at stats and numbers. You know, you, know, you, you can take a, and I've been there, I, I've watched it all. You can take a left-handed pitcher with a above average changeup, have them go to the Cal League, throw 50% changeups, and next thing you know, the, his worth looks great, his value looks great because he can just dominate with a changeup and he gets to double A and it's a whole different story. And that's what experience tells us. You know, that's, that's what experience has taught me. The higher levels I've seen of baseball, it's easier to go back and help roadmap guys to a higher level because we know that if you don't have fastball command, it's not how many fastballs you're using in a game, it's when you use it, can you execute it? You know, we've seen that fastball usage 
creep down to you know right around 50 percent well you know in the big leagues we're the highest usage fastball team at 57 percent and um you know, our velocity is right around 23 or 24 in the league. So, you know, in my opinion, if you have uh, a low velocity uh, at 23 or 24, maybe your breaking balls aren't breaking as quick. So you can't, you know, why would you throw average breaking balls in the strike zone when you, you can throw an average fastball to different parts of the strike zone? So that's the big thing is talking to players is like, look, I don't, you know, I don't care how many fastballs you throw in the big leagues. It's when you throw it, you're able to execute it. But if I look at your fastball usage in the minor leagues and see, you know what, you use it at 55% of the time at 60% strikes and league average is 64, those big league hitters, from my experiences and what the data tells me, they're not going to swing at you as much. Now they're going to force you to throw that fastball. And if you haven't used that fastball enough, and I'm not talking about how hard it is, I'm talking about being able to effectively use it and, and use your location with it. Uh, those guys need to work on that. And that's why I stress a lot of fastballs in the minor leagues. Now, obviously personnel will play a, a role in it. You know, I'm not expecting Sergio Romo to come to the big leagues and throw uh 75% fastballs. You know, it's a, it's a different story, but so the main thing talking with these young kids is talking about big picture thinking. You know, we, we do live in a velocity world. Hey, I love it. Ask our, ask our uh, scouting director, you know. Uh, I love velocity, but at the end of the day, it has to be useful. You have to have useful velocity. If you don't have useful velocity, it's just worth nothing. That's why I stress, you know, commanding the fastball, getting outs. It's all about those things. So when you're talking to these young kids, hey, it's great to throw hard. But what's your useful velocity? Where can you move it around? If you can't move it around, you need to work on moving it around. You might get that cup of coffee in the big leagues, but you won't be sustainable mm -hmm. by head whacking and just trying to overthrow your fastball. So, I mean, with that, we can get into the fastball uh, topic there. But for these young kids, it's about creating an atmosphere of big picture thinking. You know, they have to understand it. And, and yes, sometimes the failure has to happen first before you can really get in on who and what they are. But, you know, a lot of them come out of the shoot and they're, they're, they're telling you they should be in the big leagues tomorrow. And uh, you know, you know, otherwise. I think there's some really fantastic points there because, you know, not, not I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be able to coach a lot of the guys through a lot of the different levels. And you see that the game has really changed over the last, I would say, seven to 10 years on how they view fastball development to where they get a young player in. And I've been able to talk to a lot of different orgs recently. And it's always, we want to establish that breaking ball early in a guy's career. But I, I agree with what you're saying is the younger a player is, the better we need to establish that fastball, if I understand you correctly, right? Yeah, yeah. Because everything's going to tunnel, everything's going to break off that fastball plane. If you're not able to locate the fastball, throwing the off-speed pitches it's, it's not going to work at the big leagues. And you use Sergio Romo as an example. He might throw 70 some odd percent off speed pitches, but he can still dot a fastball to whatever side of the plate that he wants. And for anyone who doesn't know who Sergio Romo is, just get on YouTube, look it up. It's pretty impressive. You know, it's pretty fun to watch him pitch, but again, fastball command and he tunnels that just Frisbee off of everything else that he throws. But again, the fastball is so important. And I think that's something that's being lost in today's baseball world and you know Bart and Ryan know but I recently started coaching at a high school as, as, a, as a manager here in you know a small little area in Salt Lake and those guys get on Instagram and they see oh look at this guy throwing 97 is he you know running guns one three quarters of the way up a screen I go look we're not we're not throwing 105 and even if we were in high school no one's swinging at that anyways we have to be able to throw strikes with a fastball and our whole thing is more than velocity it takes so much more than velocity. So I know we touched on a little bit and I know we, we said we can go a whole thing on the fastball. I'd like to go on a whole thing on the fastball command, if you don't mind, if, unless you guys want to talk about something different, but I'd like to hear from the top level of the game, how important that fastball command well, is. Well, you know, what, what's a breaking ball in the strike zone? It's a hanger. And if you've got to depend on throwing hanging breaking balls, you know, you, over the course of a sample size, the hitters are just going to sit in the zone with a breaking ball. 
Now, if you have fastball command, you're able to move it around. Now you're able to get guys to chase breaking balls outside the zone. Look, the best pitchers in the game can work outside the strike zone because they have electric stuff and uh, they move their fastball around when they need it. And uh, you, I mean, just look at the best pitchers in the game. Their fastball percentage for strikes are above 65%. Uh, they do get chased with breaking balls because hitters have to respect that fastball. If you don't have to respect that fastball and you're just looking for balls breaking out of the zone, breaking out of the zone, uh, in my opinion, you're in trouble as a pitcher. Um, and, you know, especially as a starting pitcher, you just can't go out there and constantly throw slider, slider, slider. And then all of a sudden, what you have to realize is now you're changing the counts. You know, I've, I've heard people say, well, if your slider is your best pitch, throw it more. Yeah, throw it more, maybe go from 30 to 35%. But if you're going from 30 to 55, 65%, now all of a sudden you're compromising counts. You're throwing more breaking balls inside the strike zone. Hey, look, right now, any of you guys throw me an 81 mile an hour breaking ball, I got a chance to hit it, all right? I got a chance. You throw me something 95, I got no chance. So uh, that's the way I see breaking balls. If I constantly see 83 miles an hour, I'm gonna adjust the spin or, or the speed and that ball's gonna be inside the strike zone. I'm gonna do damage on you. You know, I want that element of surprise. I want that ball breaking in the zone, out of the zone. And the best way for me to do that is have that ability to make the hitter think I still have that fastball in my pocket. Yeah. And, and just to, I want to make sure that I'm understanding you clearly and that everyone listening is understanding clearly to give some examples of it. There's very few people that have made a living. And when I say living, I mean like they're pitching four or five, six years in the big leagues, throwing primarily just one pitch, very few people, you know, for, to be successful in the big leagues from your experience, would you say, at a minimum, you're going to need two pitches you can throw to at least two separate locations. And to be a starter, you're looking at three, maybe four pitches to really be successful long-term in the big leagues. Would you think that's pretty accurate? Yeah, that's real accurate. I mean, the, the best pitchers, you know, I hear pitch to your strengths, pitch to your strengths. That's great. And I believe in that. But the best pitchers in the world have the ability to attack a hitter's weakness because they have a strength. You know, if you look at uh, right-handed pitchers who can't get right-handed hitters out, the first thing you see is he's probably got no breaking ball. And then a right-hander who can't get a left-handed hitter out, you see he's got no changeup. I mean, that's generally immediately you look at when you see the splits and the data will back those numbers up. So, you know, I tell our guys, look, if it's strength on strength because you can't exploit a weakness, then that's what you have to do. But if you can exploit a hitter's weakness with a strength, that's powerful. And that's why fastball command is always shows up because there's always an area of the plate that's a weakness to a hitter with a fastball, whether it's up, whether it's deep in, whether it's reach away, you know, generally, you know, 90% of, um, of reports, they're, they're up and in to guys or they're down and away with fastballs. Those two quadrants of the plate are, are gold for you. And so you got to be able to learn how to do that. Now, up and in to a righty is the opposite side of the plate, up and into a lefty, and the same with down and away. So you need to be able to command your fastball or throw it to those areas at will and be able to open up the other part of the plate with something soft. And then you got to be able to throw something soft in a fastball count in the big leagues. You can't be predictable. And then if you're predictable, I mean, I'm not going to say the team or the guy or the name, but uh, I called 50 straight pitches on one guy a couple years ago. I just looked at his usage on the iPad and made educated guesses. This is what the guy's throwing here. And, and he did. And uh, because he just looked at the stats and the numbers, you know, three, one off speed, ball four, two run homer next at bat. And, uh, you know, but your pitchers can only do what they're capable of doing out there too. I mean, if you take what the good guys do, I remember years ago, why don't we all pitch like the Astros? Okay, well, how about if you give us all three Cy Young Award winners, you know, take away what they were doing and see Thank what you. the other 10 guys <laughs> were doing. You, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, numbers get skewed in a different way, and I'm a huge number guy. I love numbers. I do love velo, but I love useful velo, and, and I just like – you know, take all your guys' information that's out there. You know, I was a big ASMI guy when they were rolling. And, um, you know, I know my first day in the big leagues, Bob Melvin was like, you're a big number guy. And I was like, whoa, no, no. 
I know the numbers because that's my job. Uh, you know, and I, I know I've posted this on LinkedIn. I'm not old school. I'm not new school. I'm right school. And I've heard other guys come back at me and say, well, you're in school. And that's, <laughs> I love it, you know, because, you know, this game is changing and good coaches adapt and change. How many batting stances did Cal Ripken have in his career? He adapt, he changed. And that's why, you know, you guys are very important uh, to, to my career uh, because I read all your information. I like reading everybody's information. You know, I, I feel like uh, there's uh, theoretical data and there's practical data. The, 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 I, got, I got great analysts in the big leagues with me. Uh, Pike Goldschmidt, Ben Lowry, uh, Darren Jackson, Samantha Schultz. You know, we have four of them that I deal with and they're awesome. They bring me their th theories, right? And then my job is to, you know, some, kind, some days I'm like, what the heck are you guys talking about? Really? You want us to do what? But it gets me thinking. And then when I start thinking, I'm thinking, well, they see something. How can I put that to practical use? You know, and that's my job is to relay the information to the players that they're giving me. And, and you know, I, I say, you know, sometimes it's off the wall, but to them, it's not off the wall. And then when I start kind of putting it into what I call, you know, baseball terms or coaching terms, whatever you want to call it, I start thinking, you know what? They're right. If, if we can take this theory and apply it, we'll, we'll get this guy better. But then, you know, it's my job to go back to the, the analysts and say, well, we're not to that point with this guy. You know, there's too many guys in rookie ball trying to make Hall of Fame pitches that just can't make pitches yet. I, I wanted to jump in on something. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm resonating with all the things you're saying about fastball use. And uh, it, you're seeing it from a real competitive lens. And in, this, in the world of sports science and health, people are very afraid of fastball use because in biomechanics, research shows in a lot of different studies that the fastball has the greatest loads on the arm, the shoulder and the elbow, you know, but we, we need to be at an intersection of competition, competitive performance and health. And to me, what you're saying makes total sense. And with our product, you know, I don't want to be salesy on this, but with our product, you know, we're going to allow guys to know how to adjust, you know, based on um, their fastball usage and based on their throwing programs, because if we can keep the arms strong and they can handle that capacity, yeah, why not push fastball usage? You know, why not, why not, um, you know, increase the demands because they can handle it, you know, and that's kind of when I was with the, the angels, um, my hat was a little different. I, I was very uh, anxious, I would say, when I was the director of performance integration, I was looking at sports science and helping the medical staff, the pitching coaches and strength and conditioning. I got really worried about athletes that use the fastball a lot. You know, they were kind of on my radar. But when we started to in, in, uh, introduce joint strength testing, we had a very sophisticated piece of equipment where, you know, what we have at armcare.com goes in a bag. Like this thing was a huge contraption, but um, we could then see, you know what, this athlete's really strong. And if he's in, you know, like what you're saying in this, in, in the, the high fifties, 60 range, you know, that's okay. He can handle that capacity. And then what we take with another athlete, if we wanted to get him there, you know, we would have to advance their strength. And I see, you know, um, pitching, throwing, and strength training to be like a volume mixer you know you're dialing up one you might have to dial down the other but I, I believe I firmly believe that we make the arms super strong we're gonna we're gonna be able to locate better you know there's been research to show that changes in shoulder strength affect release point or if release point isn't affected it's changing tilt angle you know if I can't get my hand in a certain release position and we see consistency there and the strength is down for their shoulder, they start leaning, they start doing some different things biomechanically, the pitchers do. So I, you know, I'm, I'm seeing what you're, you're saying. It's, I'm, it's resonating with me. It's like, you see such a competitive emphasis of fastball, not just for velocity, but fastball use, you know, the frequency of use. But I think when we start monitoring, we get a strong monitoring approach with that. We're going to ensure that all the nuts and bolts are tight. 
you know, and that the athlete is, is well prepared for performance. So I, I'm, I'm excited, you know, about what you're saying here. And I, I'm excited about other coaches that are thinking about this and saying, well, I'm going to be, you know, my guys are going to be throwing harder. They're going to have a lot more higher stress deliveries, um, biomechanically speaking, but now I can evaluate their strength. They can make adjustments. So it's awesome stuff. Well, the, the one thing I would say about that, you know, you, you take the, uh, you know, obviously the fastball, the, the high hand speed pitch is your, your, your highest guy at risk with Tommy John, which are mostly right-handed relievers. Then it goes to right-handed starters, left-handed relievers, and then left-handed starters. Why does it go that way? Right-handed relievers? Well, think about right-handed relievers are fa generally failed starters. They might have a delivery issue. They're max effort guys who they throw it to the zone. They don't have great command. And then the right-handed starters generally throw harder than the left-handed relievers and, and down, down the chain. But the one thing that you know I've never seen a study on, I've asked for this study to, to be done, is okay, the, the, right, the, the fastball um, can be the high uh, risk pitch, uh, but when the delivery starts to break down and I start to tire during a game and I'm at 78 pitches, is that fastball delivery breaking down more than the curveball delivery? Or is that curveball delivery breaking down? Am I working to get on top of that curveball at, at uh, my 43rd curveball of my 85 pitch outing? And now I'm working harder to get on top of that breaking ball where I don't have to work as hard to get on top of that fastball. So, you know, it's it's my thought that I've always been told we're only we're only studying a fresh healthy arm at the time. We're not we're not 90 pitches into an outing and then determining hey which pitch is more likely to hurt yourself either the curveball or the fastball. If if I'm out of the synchronization of my delivery, I'm worn out, I'm tired, I need to go another inning for the ball club you know, what pitch am I putting myself at risk for? Am I putting it at risk throwing a curveball with snappage or throwing my fastball? So, you know, I, I think the numbers, we always, we always do the studies for the good. We never come yeah. out and do a study for the bad. Um, yeah. You know, and so that's where, you know, maybe it's my creative weird mind that starts and it's not, not stirring the pot, pot but it's asking, I want to know. You know, I, I, you know, TrackMan 2011 in Papago, they're giving me the data. And I'm like, I, I want to know when the, I called it tree branching. Now it's tunneling. So I got beat on the verbiage. I lost out uh, on somebody else calling it tunneling. I was like, I want to know when the ball deviates. They couldn't give me the answer. They said, our analysts, this was 2011 when we had a, just a square TrackMan mobile anchored on a pole at Papago. It actually melted and we couldn't use it because <laughs> uh, we, we had it melted or we had it embedded in uh, behind one of the bullpen mounds and uh, we didn't probably didn't take the heat into account over the over the course of a year. But, you know, all this stuff that uh, is out there is stuff that a lot of people have thought about for 30 years. I mean, I, I, I used to tell people, dude, I mean, 1985, I threw baseballs down the bottom of my swimming pool. I went down and got them a couple days later and me and my best friend, Rob Johnson played catch with weighted balls. We've, we've, you know, <laughs> we, they've been around. Uh, we just got better websites, right? We got better people to quantify it and study uh, plyo balls. When I came over to the Oakland A's in 2003, we were using plyo balls in 2003 with certain people. Now at the time, our medical department really didn't like them because there wasn't that much data and research on a plyo ball, but we used them on certain guys to do arm patterns. We did, and that's factual. But you know, the one thing about the pro people is we don't we don't generally have our own websites and go out and write our own term papers and and throw our name out there. I got a job, you know, and, and <laughs> I, I don't need to work for armcare.com yet. You know, maybe someday. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I get to come out here and, and tell you guys, you know, what's factual, what's true, what's really working in the game and, and what doesn't and who's sustainable and why. Yeah, that's awesome, man. You unpacked a ton there. Um, I, I wrote some notes down and you're right. Like as a biomechanist, that's what I am academically. I, I'm very critical of biomechanics and, and I'm always trying to find points to, to refute 
the the information we're taking from it and you you hit the nail on the head um you know people aren't doing fatigue studies they're not looking at breakdown you're right most of the studies most of the knowledge we know is essentially on 10 pitches or less and and we're trying to extrapolate what's going on in the game you know this has kind of been my issue with it like just what you're saying is that you know we can't we can't predictively understand where it, how breakdown is happening and then you know then, in, in a lab you know nothing nothing towards anybody who's studying pitching because I, I love all the studies out there but sometimes they'll drop uh in uh 10 elite pitchers we studied uh five elite high school guys and five elite college guys you know yeah. i mean you take the best reliever in the world right now we all know who he is and where he came from uh, you know, this guy gets on his toe before he leaves the mound. And, you know, everybody talks about getting into the ground and using ground force, which I love, but there's different types of body types and different types of movers. And I can tell you, this guy's the best reliever in the world. And he gets up on his toe and he's late at foot strike. So there's, there's just so many things that, that, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to find the needle in the haystack, which we'll never find because yeah. everything's going to always change. And I always, and I always, you know, say there's really no such thing as science, because when when one company comes out and figures out something, the other company is going to refute it. If you guys just studied the same thing, wouldn't it be the same? But we're finding out different things because different people have different approaches to their study and different ideas to their study. It doesn't mean anybody's wrong. That's my point. Nobody's wrong. It's just these set of people found that it's best to do this and it's best to do that. I mean, I can tell you um, in my day, I enjoyed a lot of chicken wings and a lot of uh, adult iced teas. And I got up to, to close to 300 pounds. And one off season, I said, enough's enough. I'm going to go on a diet. Well, I did a diet and I lost 70 pounds in an off season, four months, 70. I wow. was strict. I was right on top of it. But if I did another company's diet and I was strict on top of it, I'm pretty sure I would have lost the 70 pounds uh, doing their diet as well. So that's when I get, you know, on these, uh, 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 you know, when I kind of, uh, I don't know, lash out or tell the truth that, uh, you know, we're just drop downs in a toolbar. There's no tool out there, zero, that's going to guarantee me success. Zero tools. You can get any of those tools online and buy, they can help us get to uh, be better. But I mean, I, I've even wrote down, if you're going to guarantee it, will you give me my money back? And no one responds to me on that stuff. And, but that's true. I mean, if you're going to guarantee success for me, then if I don't have success, pay me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've used an example before on some previous uh, podcasts with guests we have. Just because I own a toolbox doesn't mean I'm a carpenter. You know, like I've made some pretty, you know, condemned birdhouses in my day in shop class and done things like that. And it's, it requires the understanding of what that tool is supposed to do and then where that best fits. And, you know, TrackMan may be a great tool for one player. It may be their downfall for another to where it gets them thinking about the wrong thing or it might have this guy think perfectly like that. It all, it all depends on the individual. And like you said earlier, you meet the player where it is they're at. You would, you adjust to the player. Um, so I think there's always a place for those tools when it comes to it, but some guys don't need the tools. Just like, you, you know, you're pointing out it, there's a time and a place for everything. Well, you know, you give somebody, if you got a hundred pieces of information, I want to know that as a coach, give me all the information there's certain guys that can take 15 of it. There's certain guys that can take 80 of it. Uh, but if you're cramming and cramming information down people's throats and telling them, this is how you have to do it. It's not true. You know, it's just not true. I've seen plenty of bad delivery guys. Well, all of us would call bad delivery guys have success and never get hurt. I've seen guys yeah. you look up, they got great deliveries. They're pretty, they're either backing up third base or they, they can't make the club because they're in the tub in the training room all the time. And you're like, gosh, this guy's delivery is on point. His kinetic chain is perfect. He's beautiful. Well, he can't get out of the tub, you know? So 
that's what that's what the awareness that I want to give to the parents is just because you're paying thousands and thousands of dollars for certain things doesn't make it a guarantee. You know, Absolutely. it can help you uh, hopefully get better or strive to be better, but it, it's not going to guarantee you anything. There, there's no need to add any more to that. I mean, that's uh, that's clearly the truth there. Absolutely. I, I was the first one to the park and the last one to leave. And everybody teases me that my best pitch in pro ball was my pickoff move. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm a student of the game. Uh, I've always been that. And that's probably put me in this position. But, uh, you know, just because you're the hardest worker and you got the most passion for the game doesn't make you good. <laughs> it'll, it'll get you closer, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of really good, good points in there for sure. So Scott, you said you do do some clinics sometimes. What, I mean, if you were on your soapbox right now, talking to some parents of, you know, you talked a little bit about what they should be focusing on, but what would you be telling them? Well, you know, the, the, the first thing when I'm looking at a pitcher and building a program uh, at the top of the pyramid is outs. How do we get our outs, right? Uh, your delivery is your foundation at the bottom of the pyramid. That's like, you know, laying the, laying the groundwork to build a house. You know, you, you need to have a, a repeatable delivery. What's good for you, not what's good for the coach or not what's good for, uh, you know, our, our kinetic chain information. What makes you throw strikes? And then what makes you throw quality strikes? And then we kind of work backwards from there. You know, we, we look at each individual pitch, each individual fastball. Can you locate your fastball? Uh, can you move it from side to side? Can you land a breaking ball? And can you throw a wipeout breaking ball? Now, after that, now you're starting to look at, uh, you know, spin rates do play a part of it. Guys with high spin, which for me, 2,300 plus, maybe 2,400, you get to throw a little bit more at the top of the zone. And then anything under 2,100, 2,000, you're probably pitching more a little bit at the bottom of the zone. And that's where that, you know, 21 to 2300, you know, you kind of lay in the middle. You really got to execute and, and make your pitches. It's hard to tell a guy uh, to elevate who's got, you know, 18, 19 inches of drop and his ball ends up dropping back down into the bottom of the zone. So now you, you got to pick and choose when to go up and when to go down. But, you know, I, I preach five elements of pitching. Location, change of speeds, movement, effort level, and velocity. Location is always a key. And that's with all your pitches. Having the ability to, to backdoor a breaking ball, to, uh, uh, to front hip a fastball, to back foot your breaking <coughs> ball, elevate. Change of speeds, I always talk about if hitting's timing, uh, pitching is disruption of timing. Every, every podcast, every meeting I ever have on pitching is always going to include, you know, uh, pitching is disruption of timing, uh, period. You know, it, uh, it doesn't matter how you do it. If you throw 90 and an 80 mile an hour change up, you're disruption, uh, disrupting time. And if you throw 100 and you're, you throw a 90 miles an hour change up, you're disrupting timing. You want to disrupt the timing. And I always talk about, uh, you know, when we were kids in the living room and we were playing sock ball and our parents didn't want us to play sock ball and our buddy got his hand up to hit the ball and you acted like you were going to gas him up and throw one real hard and you lobbed it to him. He flinches. And then you act like you got that sock in the fireplace as the strike zone. I'm going to throw it really soft and boom, at the end, you gas it up and throw it real hard. That's disruption of timing. And that gets your buddy flinching. And that's what gets the hitter out of his toe hold. That's what we want hitters doing. And then movement is just, you know, the movement of our pitches, the late movement, the late life of a sinker, the, the tail to the fastball, um, the, the quickness to your breaking ball, the shapes of your pitches, how they're shaped and how they move. Uh, the tempo for me is our fourth uh, element. And the tempo is just how fast your body can move under control to make these quality pitches. Look, I want our guys to move fast. But if they move fast and they get outside, uh, you know, we talk about stride length, you know, you know, everybody talks about, you know, 120% of your height, you'll throw gas. Well, you can get out there 120% of your height, but not be able to crash the upper half over the lower half. That stride length now becomes useless. So you've got guys reading out of a book, oh, 
oh, this website says 120%. Let's just get him in the splits and he can't crash over the upper half. That, that, that's not going to help us. So I talk about how, how long is your stride? Your stride is as long or as short as it takes for the backside to get through and over the front side with proper finish. What's proper finish? Some trunk flexion, arm tuck close to your body in a straight line towards your target. Most guys can't get out to 120% of their uh, height and do that. So you got to back it up. Now, Chapman, he can. So what you do is you, you work on a stride length that has proper finish. Once they get proper finish, say it's 75% of their height and they get proper finish. Okay, well, all right, for us to maybe throw a little bit harder, to get a little bit more extension rate, let's, let's take that to 85%. As long as they stay within the kinetic chain at 85%, they can crash the backside over the front side, post up on that front leg and throw quality strikes. And we see an improvement in velo, we can keep going forward. But if we can't get guys to post up on that front front knee to, to uh to, so those hips can rotate and that arm spiral can come out, and then we can you know bend over, we're in trouble. I mean, you talk about Ryan, about I'll give you a great example. Uh during the pandemic uh, in the 2020 summer, I was like, you know, what am I gonna do? I'm bored off my rocker. I've read the entire internet. Well, I did take a biomechanist class uh, through a guy. There was 12 of us. Nobody knows who I am. I'm just on this call with a bunch of dudes and uh, you know, no one's figured out who I am. But the third week I start, I just say, you know what? You know, enough's enough. So they were talking about all this rotational stuff and being rotational and which is great and all. And I said, uh, how many of you guys on this uh, call have ever heard of Abner Doubleday? And only three other people had heard of Abner Doubleday. <laughs> and I said, I said, look, this guy's credited with inventing baseball. Yeah. He gave us a slope to throw off of. So if I'm just having all this rotational value and no trunk flexion, I'm just rotating and throwing the ball at the top of the zone and depending on gravity to pull my ball down. Well, yeah. he gave us this slope to help us use the leverage to drive balls where we need to drive them. Look, you want to throw an elevated fastball and throw uh, the ball at the top of the zone, you're probably going to elevate more, not as, have as much trunk flexion. But if you got to go down and away to your glove side, you're going to have to get down into that action a little bit. And I always tell our guys, put your, put your chin in the catcher's mitt, show them the back of the shoulder, and you probably produced something good with your mechanics. Down and away is a key to clean up some poor movement. Just go down and away. Repeat down. You could tell somebody, in my opinion, look, go out there and let me see you pepper down and away to your glove side 10 times in a row. And then let them tell you, do it. Now they have to do it. All right. How did you feel about your delivery? Oh, I didn't talk about my, I, well, I wasn't worried about my delivery. I was worried about my execution. That's what you want. You know yep. what? When you start talking too much about deliveries, and movement patterns, you know, it, it's like uh, going to a psychologist all the time. If you're going to the psychologist all the time, don't you have a problem? So if you're, <laughs> if you're constantly tinkering and working on your mechanics all day long and you can't go out there and compete and naturally feel down in the way, in my opinion, you're lost. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, hey, this has been awesome. Jordan, Ryan, do you have anything else you want to ask Scott while we got him? And he's, he's covered a lot of information and obviously given great insight to a lot of things. And, you know, I, I thought he's answered more questions than we would even hope to. So, yeah, I, I'm impressed, man. I, I'm just grateful that you're on. I'm grateful that we know each other. I write, I wrote notes. Um, I love learning from everybody. So there's some stuff that you've written down. I'm going to connect with you further on because you've really inspired a lot of thought for me so I, I appreciate you being on here Scott it's amazing well I think you know that's that's what everybody you know you know I see a lot of people bashing people all the time on the internet and you know there's the gurus and and what they call the gurus and pitching coaches you know we're all disciples of somebody and we're all plagiarizing something mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think of there's too many guys that have come up with 
these ideas on their own. You know, it's just, you know, everybody goes out there and we all have a common goal, hopefully, and that's to get our players to be the best pitchers that they can possibly be, you know, and, and velocity is a part of it. And, um, but at the end of the day, you know, I tell our guys, I don't want minor league throwers. We need major league pitchers. And the sooner you can start learning how to pitch with your velo, you look at what's going on in the game. We're getting some velo, but we're also, you know, look back at you, you pretty much. Some people will say, you know, with the new technology, everybody's uh, plus two miles an hour than what they were back in my day uh, because of how they're measuring velo. You know, all of a sudden, you know, Roger Clemens didn't throw a hundred. That dude, I, I watched that dude in the dugout. That dude just, he threw just as hard as anybody I've ever seen. So, yeah. you know, we got to remember that, but um, <laughs> The most important thing is take your velo and make it useful. You know, that, that would be something I would tell every kid uh, that, or every pitcher, you got to have useful velocity, you know, clean up your, your delivery the best you can to throw quality strikes. It, you know, I, I see, like we talked earlier, we've seen guys do the running guns or we've seen guys post videos of a guy throwing a hundred and it's, it's off the net. That does me no good. Uh, and then actual results matter you know, you know, results do matter. So I, I appreciate you guys uh, for what you do for the game. Uh, and I'm learning from you guys, you know, I, I'll throw it out there every now and then just to, to stir the pot on some, but uh, there's also a reality to, to what's going on in the game. And we, we want to get guys that can pitch multiple innings and, and keep them off the DL. 100%. Scott, thank you, everybody. Until next time, take care.